everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com and you know what time of the week it is. It's time to talk about another exciting edition of AEW Dynamite. But how good was Dynamite? Of course, there's only one way to find out and that is by assigning each individual segment a delectable individual grade. That's right, it's time for AEW Dynamite Graded. First up, we get six-man tag team action with Matt Hardy and Private Party taking on Hangman Page and John Silver and Alex Reynolds of the Dark Order. Obviously a bit of a reluctant pairing. Hangman's not too certain about what the Dark Order's motivations are, but the Dark Order are doing their best to impress him because Silver and Reynolds come out with just adorable cowboy outfits. It's really nice to see. And to be fair to them, they show good teamwork early on with some nice little nifty maneuvers, quick tags, little double and triple team moves, and uh, Silver and Reynolds are buzzing. Silver jumps on Hangman's back and rides him like a little horsey. Um, Hangman looks secretly a little bit happy as well, to be fair. More than he ever did with Omega. The heels fight back, and yes, I'm calling them the heels even though they're baby faces, because how can you root against Hangman Page and those two from the Dark Order? They're just too adorable. Uh, Matt Hardy goes for the twist of fate, but Hangman pushes him off and gets a near fall with a big lariat. Non-buckshot variation, though. There's more great teamwork from Hangman and the Dark Order, but Matt Hardy pulls Reynolds out of the ring on the count of two at one point, saving the day for his team. John Silver goes out to get him, but as he's leaning through the ropes, Matt Hardy grabs him and nails like a draping twist of fate from inside the ring to out, which looks really brutal actually. Reynolds gets back in the ring, a private party catch him with the gin and juice, and just when it looks like they've got the match won, Matt blind tags himself in and steals the pinfall for himself. Hmm. This gets a B plus grade, fun opener to the show, and as well. Interesting developments on both sides. Hangman sort of enjoying tagging with Silver and Reynolds. And on the other side, Matt Hardy not being the best of mentors to private party. Backstage now with my boy, Alex Marvez. Uh, he's with the Inner Circle. He's talking to MJF because MJF has made the New York Times list of the best performances of 2020 for his role in the Dinner Debonair. Jericho, nowhere to be seen in the nominations. That writes itself, doesn't it? That's almost too perfect for AEW. It fits right into the storyline. I'm thinking, did Tony Khan pay off the New York Times here? MJF is his obnoxious, cocky self. He says, look, I know what people are saying out there on, these, on the old social media. I know they're saying that I'm a better performer than Chris Jericho, and I think that there's no need to say that, right? Stop it. But obviously MJF, in bringing up that he disagrees, is mentioning it on TV. So it, it perfectly fits in with his character. Jericho does not look impressed. MJF turns to him and says, you know what, Chris, when I look at you, I don't see a, a substandard performer compared to myself. I see my mentor and my best friend. And Jericho's like, great, thanks, yeah. Before the next match, which is Cody versus Angelico, we get a video package from the Rhodes household. They're at home decorating the Christmas tree in formal wear, as you do. And then they get a knock on the door. They go to answer it, there's a, there's a little gift package outside, and they open it, and there's a little pair of tiny baby shoes and a note saying that basically they're expecting a child, which is lovely news. Congratulations to the Rhodeses. And Pharaoh as well, the dog, has a neckerchief which reads, uh, baby security in training. Just adorable. And now back to the arena for Cody's match. He makes his entrance with Arn and Brandy's there as well. They have a nice hug. It's a very genuine, sweet moment, but he's taking on Angelico. And Im just imagine if after all that, Angelico actually won. This match has quite a an old school start. There's a lot of gripply grappling, a lot of graps, uh, and both guys are really good at it. We know about Cody's amateur background. Whenever they take it to the mat, he's obviously doing really well. But Angelico is more than holding his own, a very skilled grappler in his own right, evidently. We take things even more old school with a bloody crisscross, which is fantastic. It's like WrestleMania 1. I don't know where that spot came from or whether it was a reference privately between them to something else, but you've got to love to see a crisscross in 2020. Cody starts to take control, so Jack Evans hops up on the apron to try and cause a distraction, but Arn Anderson yanks him all the way back down to the outside side and shoves him to the floor and Jack Evans bumps for him like HBK bumped for Hogan at SummerSlam. It's really, really funny, but you know, Jack, you've got to respect your elders. Come on, take that bump like a man and then sell it like you've just been battered. Like, don't flip around. Come on. Cody goes for the drop down uppercut, but Angelico blocks it and transitions into some kind of crazy submission that I'm not quite certain if I've seen before. It's a bit Zack Sabre Jr-esque. All of Cody's limbs are tied up, so he has to inch his way over and break the count or break the hold by grabbing the bottom rope with his teeth. Such desire. Hello, my friend, we meet a girl. A little bit later, Cody goes for the crossroads, but Angelico slips out and goes for a crossroads of his own. Cody manages to roll out of that, heads up 
top, bounce, bounce, boing, massive Cody Cutter out of the corner, and Angelico sells it like prime RVD right on his head. It looks amazing, and fittingly, it's the finish of the match, Cody wins. But before Cody's celebration can go on for too long, he is interrupted by Team Taz, who all come out on the stage. Ricky Starks says, yeah, congratulations, Cody, you're about to be a father, but where was our congratulations last week, myself and Brian Cage, when we made you and Turtle Boy our sons? Turtle Boy's Darby Allen. He likes turtles. If you know, you know. Taz gets the mic and says, Darby, Cage is gonna whoop your ass, because they've got a title match for the TNT Championship coming up soon. Darby is up in the rafters watching and just smiles. He's got a plan against Cage, he does. Taz says, but right now, Cody, we're focusing on you. We're coming to that ring. And after we're done with you, you're going to be on real paternity leave. And they all head down to the ring. The lights go out. It's Sting. Not as much impact as last time because obviously we've seen Sting do it. But still, it's cool to see, yeah, Sting. Sting walks out onto the stage. Team Taz all look at him. And Powerhouse Hobbs really wants to go for him. He wants to fight with Sting. Sting's got the back. The rest of Team Taz drag Hobbs away. But it made Hobbs look pretty tough, I suppose. It's like a bit in Superbad when McLovin gets the policemen to drag him out of the house party even though they're not arresting him. They're just pretending because it makes him look really cool. Sting doesn't even go down to the ring. He just stands there, looks at Cody in the ring, winks at him, then stares up at Darby for a bit and then just walks away. End of segment. This gets an A- grade for me. I was a big fan of that match, Cody and Angelico. Um, it was a bit of a sleeper hit in my opinion. I really liked the old school start. I liked the way that it escalated. I liked some of the inventive spots like Cody grabbing the rope with his teeth. The finish was awesome. Angelico did great. I've got no complaints with it at all. Thought it was fantastic. The post-match, I wasn't as big a fan of just because we've seen almost exactly this when Sting made his debut, saving Cody from Team Taz. But at the same time, they did use it to, I guess, get Powerhouse Hobbs over as a tough guy a little bit more. Next up, my boy, Marvez, is backstage once again with Miro this time. And Marvez reveals that Miro has been fined $75,000 redues for those three security guards that he beat up at the end of last week's show. Miro says as far as he's concerned, that money is money that Orange Cassidy owes him because he was just getting revenge on Orange Cassidy and he hates him. But Miro has good news as well. He says that next week, Kip Sabian and Penelope Ford are going to announce the date of their upcoming wedding. Very exciting stuff, uh, but then, you know, Marvez goes, Miro, let's get away from that. What about those three men you put in hospital? It's nearly Christmas. And Miro goes, bah humbug. He doesn't like Christmas because his birthday is Christmas Day. And a quick check on the old Wikipedia confirms that to be true. Next up, Eddie Kingston comes out rocking a New York Yankees cap and a Tupac t-shirt. What a contradiction. And yes, I know that Tupac was actually born in New York, but we all know that he's West Side for life. Bad boy killers. First off, F your click and the click you claim. West Side till we die. Kingston gets on the mic and says he's going to address his three enemies. First of all, the man upstairs. And he goes, I'm still alive, brother. Then his second enemy, Pac, uh, which I saw Matthew on Twitter saying counts as the first one because Pac is God, so it's a bit of a contradiction. But Kingston says Pac's done. He's not coming back after the beating that we gave him. His career is over. And then his third enemy, Lance Archer. But before he can say anything, Archer's music hits and he's barreling down to the ring. Unfortunately, he gets to the ring before the everybody dies and it's now or never. Like, the, the song's miles away from that point. I'd like Archer to take his time a little bit more, please, in future. But Archer was trying to get the jump on Kingston, so I guess that that justifies it. He starts beating Eddie down, but the Butcher and the Blade come in from behind and they turn the tide against the big man. The Lucha Bros slide in to help even the odds and then here comes Pat to tilt the brawl in the babyface's favor. He's not done at all. His career is not over. Eddie was being a little silly liar. What a cheeky man. Uh, the brawl kicks off. Everything's sort of flying all over the place. The Lucha Bros take care of the Butcher and the Blade. And then Pac and Lance Archer kind of let Kingston get away because they both want a piece of him and they're kind of getting in each other's way. So uh, that's quite cool. It shows that they're not totally on the same page even though they've got a common enemy. This gets a B grade. Fair enough. It progresses the storyline, reminds us of the animosity between Pac, Kingston and and Lance Archer as well in the equation. So no complaints here. Nothing groundbreaking, but it was fine. Grab your Glocks when you see Tupac. Call the cops when you see Tupac. Who shot me, but you punks didn't finish. Now you're... We go backstage now for a tiny little backstage interview with Dustin Rhodes because, of course, the Dark Order offered him a spot in their stable last week saying he could be number seven. Dustin says seven was a terrible idea years ago in WCW, which it was, and says that it's still a terrible idea today. He's never going to join, and he disputes this claim by the Dark Order that he is the third most important Rhodes, and he calls out Evil Uno for next week's show. 
Next up, big 12-man tag team action as all of the Inner Circle minus Wardlow take on the team of Top Flight, Best Friends and the Varsity Blondes. Great tag team names still. We get various interesting little combinations of little one-on-one -on -one mini matches in the opening stages between the two teams. The most interesting, I think, is Sammy Guevara and I think it was Dante Martin of Top Flight. Uh, they've got great chemistry. They're both so quick as well. They're running all over the place, going back and forth until Sammy gets the advantage by just rocking back and just clocking Martin right in the jaw. It's a great punch and it's sold really well too. A little bit later on we get a big stare down between arch rivals, best friends and the proud and powerful and it escalates into a full-blown brawl from all members of both teams. The faces clear the ring, they have a big six-way hug. Orange Cassidy by the way I should mention at this point is on guest commentary but he doesn't say a word who was expecting him to and the faces take control but not for long because soon after Trent becomes the face in peril for a while with various heels taking turns to beat him down. He finally gets the hot tag to Darius Martin who goes for a dive but Ortiz is outside the ring. He clocks him before he can get through the ropes. They celebrate proud and powerful on the outside but here comes Dante, huge tope over the top of his brother onto the heels below. Griff Garrison becomes the legal man next. Uh, he's running wild a little bit, clearing the ring slightly but it's not good enough because Chris Jericho is on the outside with the baseball bat out of the view of the referee Bam! Baseball bat shot right to the back and Griff Garrison is there for the taking. Jake Hager gets in the ring and hits a modified version, shall we say, of Wardlow's F10. It's not pretty, but it's enough. Uh, Wardlow tags out to MJF, he gets in, he gets the pinfall and that's the end of the match. The heels win. The fight continues after the bell and it's top flight who get the better of it. They send Jericho and MJF packing and it sets up a tag match for I believe next week between Top Flight and Jericho and MJF. That's confirmed later on in the night. Also later on in a separate backstage interview, the best friends say that they're gonna be there to see what Sabian and Ford and Miro have to say about their wedding announcement next week. Oh, they're gonna crash it. They're gonna do naughty things. This gets a B grade, it was fun, a fun match. Um, Again, nothing of real substance, I suppose, but it set up things for later on. That was very much the theme of a lot of this show, actually, setting up things for the holiday season. Next up, we go backstage where my boy, Marvez, he's really putting in a shift tonight. He's there with Thunder Rosa, and Thunder Rosa says she firmly believes that she belongs in AEW. She's wrestled all around the world, and she doesn't believe what Britt Baker says when she says that she doesn't belong. She thinks she does belong, and she thinks that Britt's wrong. She also says that Britt had to stick her big nose in Thunder Rosa's match with Serena Deeb. Now, that's a bit harsh, isn't it? Now, Reba, or Rebel, comes along and agrees, apparently, because she gets in Thunder Rosa's face. She's like, do not ever disrespect Britt Baker. It's all a distraction because he is Britt from behind, jumps Thunder Rosa, gets her down on the floor, and puts on the lockjaw. While Thunder Rosa's in the lockjaw, Rebel, Reba, pours water on her face to wash off some of the face paint, and then Britt says, is that camera still working? Or has her ugly face broken it? Ugh. Now, I'm not sure how I really feel about physical insults being included in a feud like this, uh, because, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a lazy trope that WWE often fall back on, for example, especially with their women's division. And I'd like to see AEW maybe use a little bit more originality when it, when it comes to giving their women's roster character motivation. Next up, it's SCU, uh, Daniels and Kazarian, taking on the team that are quickly becoming my boys, I think, in AEW, along with Alex Marvez, of course, the acclaimed Max Caster and Anthony Bowens. And obviously a big reason for that is because I love spitting some bars, and Max Caster loves spitting some bars as well. He's like Chris Daniels, nothing but a doormat. Call him CD, because he's an outdated format. And I'm like, oh my god! He also says that Frankie Kazarian's got hair plugs, but the rhyme scheme, unfortunately, isn't as good for that one. Uh, Bowens, as well, while this is all going on, shows a CD to the camera, which has Nickel Buck on it, and it's a Photoshop. It's like Nickelback, but the Young Bucks, implying, I think, that the Young Bucks are outdated and terrible. And I know that it's not cool really these days to say that Nickelback are bad. It's a bit of an unoriginal take. A lot of people are, are saying, basically, you know, Nickelback are actually all right. I'd just like to clarify my position and say that, no, I, Nickelback are bad. Like, come on. Although if I've had a few drinks, I will heartily sing along to the song Rockstar on any given night out. So that, I mean, you have to give them credit for that one. And you know what? Photograph's quite funny as well to shout along to. But Kazarian, surprisingly, spits some bars of his own. He's like, out here with your gold chain and your dissing. Are you the acclaimed or are you men on a mission? And I'm like, oh. Oh, here we go. We get to the match, and SCU, as the veterans, control a lot of the match. They're kind of making the acclaim look a little bit outmatched here. They've won a lot of matches on Dark, obviously, but on Dynamite, against a team like SCU, maybe it's a bit of a different prospect. Uh, occasionally, the acclaimed will try and make a little bit of a comeback, but SCU will 
cut them off usually and it's a bit of a weird format because often you see i mean usually you see this reversed with the heels beating down the faces and the face is trying to make the comeback daniels tries to roll up bowens but he pushes him off at the count of two and daniels flies face first through the ropes and cast is outside with the boom box and daniels head hits the boom box he falls back into the ring and bowens hits him with some kind of like twisting slam it's pretty good and it's enough to put Daniels away too. Casta gets on the mic and challenges the Bucks who are in the crowd to a tag title match in the near future. Uh, and the Bucks accept. Casta also says that the Young Bucks are cucks and, and compares them to women when they're on their periods. So it's good to know that Max Casta has the humor of an elite pro gamer, really. Yo, the acclaimed, look at them, what do you see? A pretty decent match, this segment gets a B. Now let's move on to the next part of the show. My name is Jack and I'm really good, bro, at rapping. I'm gonna keep on going, going with the flow. There's no way I'm slowing my roll. And I'm genuinely surprised I got that far. Next up, we get Serena Deeb teaming up with Big Swole to take on Diamante and Eva Lise. And in the start of this match, there's a lot of the heels beating down Big Swole, but eventually she gets the hot tag to the NWA Women's Champion. Deeb gets in the ring. She gets a nice looking leg lock on Eva Lise, but Eva Lise rolls and just about manages to get the ropes. Later on, Big Swole goes for dirty dancing, but as she goes to swing at Diamante, Eva Lise is behind her on the apron as the illegal woman in the match grabs her by the hair and stops her from doing that. Diamante tries to take control, but Swole nails her with a headbutt sort of a tiger driver and then locks her up in a clover leaf and it's looking bad for the heels. Ivelisse tries to get in the ring but Serena Deeb is on it. She is of course the NWA Women's Champion as I just mentioned. She runs across the ring, intercepts Ivelisse and holds her back and eventually Diamante has to tap out. But now here comes Nyla Rose and Vicky Guerrero and Nyla leads a four on two, three and a half on two because Vicky's trying, she's putting a few boots in, uh, beat down of the babyface team. But here comes Red Velvet with a steel chair to save the day, hits Nyla Rose in the back and all the heels disperse. And I think that a, a vicious squashing could be in Red Velvet's future. This gets a B minus grade. It wasn't bad, I just didn't particularly enjoy it. But again, like many things on this show, I think this was more about building for the future rather than meant to be a, a, you know, a quality match in itself. Just a tiny little segment now before the main event, we get a Jurassic Express video package and then we get FTR interrupting this or you know, coming out after this, going to the announce table and complaining to the commentators that the focus is on the Sideshow tag team, the freaks, and not on FTR themselves. So a nice little reminder, I guess, that FTR exist and continuing to hype their feud, which will eventually happen you know, with Jurassic Express, which I am looking forward to actually. Bit of a novelty feud, you know, the traditionalists against the very different oddball newer tag team. I think it's gonna be pretty good. And finally, the main event of the night, Kenny Omega versus Joey Janela in a no DQ match. Now, if Janela wins, he gets a title shot against Omega because of course Janela was never eliminated from the tournament. He was injured and unable to compete. Janela is out with Sonny Kiss. Omega gets his huge elaborate entrance, of course. He's with Don Callis and as he saunters his way down to the ring so arrogant he gets absolutely clocked with a trash can shot from Janela who's wasting no time here. Meanwhile as this is going on Callis goes over to the announce table and he's got a mic and he says Tony you can't call a Kenny Omega match I need to call this match get out and Tony just big dogs him and he goes no. So Callis just walks down to ringside and starts calling the match anyway on the still live mic. No idea why they would cut Taz's mic a few weeks ago, but not Don Callis is here when he is just so disrupting the main event match of the night. Doesn't really make sense in kayfabe, but you know, Callis is a good talker, so I'm not that mad about it. And Callis is commentating while Kenny's doing all kinds of spots like a Kataro Crusher on a steel chair. He's going up top with the trash can and moonsaulting off and landing on Janela. It's all like hardcore-y stuff, but with Kenny Omega's style infused slightly. Another big spot from Kenny, who is just dominating Janela here, not even giving him anything really. He lays the trash can on him, heads up top, double foot stomp to the trash can on Janela. He gets Janela up for the one-winged angel, but at this point, Joey threatens to turn the tide of the match because he, he like reverses it with a nice and quite nasty looking poison or like reverse Rana. Sonny Kiss sets up a table for Janela on the outside. They lay Omega on it. Janela heads up to the top and comes off with a leg drop and crushes Kenny and seems to land on his face as well, which is nasty. But thankfully, Omega looks to have escaped damage. Back in the ring, Janela goes up top, looks for a moonsault, Omega rolls out the way, V-trigger, second V-trigger, one-winged angel, that's all she wrote. Dawn gets on the mic to close the show and says now that he's being Janela, there are no more unanswered questions for the champ. And he's interrupted by Pac 
and the Lucha Bros. Pac's got a mic of his own and he says no more unanswered questions really because my friend Ray Phoenix was also never eliminated from the tournament. And that's why we want to see Phoenix versus Kenny Omega. And Callis says, whoa, whoa, Pac, have you had like a promotion or something? Because wrestlers are not allowed to call out the champion. And Pac says, wait, well, hey, Bonnie lad, I've just been talking to Tony Khan, which I bet was a really interesting conversation actually with Tony just not having a clue what Pac was on about. But the match has been confirmed. Kenny Omega defending his belt against Phoenix on December 30th. That should be a really good match. The pair of them have got a great chemistry and Omega closes the show by selling this as if he's just found out that Cactus Jack is coming back and Mick Foley's brought back his evil persona because Kenny's like channeling Triple H in that segment. He's like, no, no, not Phoenix. You've beaten him before. This final segment gets a B. I, I enjoyed the match. It, again, it was a bit style over substance, I suppose, with just big hardcore spot after big hardcore spot. Uh, but at the same time, it was entertaining, I guess. We had Carlos on the mic. Even Kenny got involved on the mic a little while, calling his own match as he was doing it. It was unique and entertaining in its own little way. Uh, a B grade, I think, is fair, but I am very much looking forward to Omega versus Phoenix in two weeks' time. Overall, this show gets a B grade from me, maybe slightly below par for an episode of AEW Dynamite, maybe a little bit below their usual standards, but as I've mentioned, the next three shows are pretty big ones. Next week, it's obviously the, the post-NBA edition where it's starting a bit later on in the night, and usually after a big NBA game, they do try and, you know, make the show a big one to catch the attention of any potential new viewers who just haven't changed channel after the basketball's finished. Then, of course, the two holiday specials on the two subsequent weeks after that. So this, this show, I think, was kind of sacrificed a little bit and just used to build up to those big three coming up. But what did you think though? Let me know in the comment section down below and of course thank you very much for watching this video. Um, stay safe out there of course, stay positive. I've been Jack from Cultaholic.com, I don't know if I mentioned that as well. And um, I'll see you very soon. Have a good one.